My name is Ian Graham, and first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present some highlights of my group's research to this excellent York Talk series. The title of my talk is Plants versus Bugs for Making Drugs. <clears throat> and I, I hope the, the, the relevance of this statement becomes apparent during, during uh, my presentation, but essentially, what it, what it gets to is uh, that plants make an amazing array of medicinal products. And, uh, and today, because of biotechnology, we can, we can develop plants for production of a number of drugs. And we can also engineer bugs uh, to make those same drugs. And so I want to give you all some insight into the processes involved behind that. And of course, being a plant scientist, I still favor plants. Uh, before we get into some of the details, I also wanted to give you some context of the evolution behind all of these amazing natural products that are produced in plants. And this sort of schematic simply shows the evolution of life on Earth that's occurred over the last four billion years. And uh, it started off with the emergence of life from primordial soup. And then if you fast track right through to about half a billion years ago, 500 million years ago, then uh, that's when the, the Cambrian explosion led to land plants and, and uh, with that, the evolution of many animals on, on, on land. And, and with plants, what, because they can't move, they've evolved over 500 million years to develop a really rich, arsenal of chemicals that protect them from all sorts of things that the environment throws at them, uh, protects them from animals, protects them from bacteria, from all sorts of other pathogens. And, and also when we come to about 100 million years ago, you can see with flowers and bees, uh, the emergence of flowering plants and plants evolving a scent for flowers and wonderful colors, all coming from chemicals. Uh, that attract bees and insects that allow pollen to spread and allow sexual reproduction. And, and so this evolution of all of these molecules has been happening for millions and millions of years. Humans then emerged uh, relatively recently with Homo, Homo sapiens appearing 200,000 200, years ago. And, uh, and with that, the realization in human civilization that we could use those chemicals from plants, use plants not just for food and shelter and everything else, but uh, use the chemicals as drugs. And, and that's, uh, that's what I work on. And that's what really interests me, the evolution of, of those molecules and how, how, how we use them and how we can use them better. And so today I'm just going to focus on four uh, of these molecules and introduce them to you. The two at the top here, artemisinin and camphor, are produced by a plant called Artemisia annua. Artemisinin is amazing. It's the, the main drug used to kill the malaria parasite. Camphor, you may know, is a smaller molecule, it's, but it's the scent that you smell from mothballs, so it deters insects. Noscopene and codeine are produced by opium poppy, Noscopene is used uh, as an antitussive, as a, a, a cough treatment. And codeine, oh, you'll all have heard of it, is, uh, is an analgesic, an opiate-based analgesic. So, so my group works on all of these molecules. And I'm going to give you some insight into what we've been doing with them. I'll focus first on artemisinin. Uh, and the, before I do that, the scientific strategy that, that we follow consistently and have done over the last 15 years to work on some of these amazing plants. Uh, we rely on natural variation uh, that's out there in the natural world. And that's why it's so important to protect the biodiversity that we have. And the great, uh, the great concern about losing biodiversity on our planet is, is when we lose that, we lose some of those valuable compounds. Uh, we also, uh, enhance that variation by, by using mutagenesis. And, and then we use this technology of DNA sequencing, which has revolutionized the whole of life sciences over the last you know, couple of decades. 
And, and so we can rapidly sequence genomes and we can ra rapidly discover natural variation. And of course, then that allows us to develop better plants for better production and, and go through to commercial production of some of those compounds. You'll see how we go about doing that. The other outcome of DNA sequencing, just as it is with, with COVID and identifying new variants, is that we discover variants. We also discover genes. And, and, and coming down the right side of this graph, you can see that that gene discovery is essentially the currency of synthetic biology, this new technology of synthetic biology and engineering biology, which many, many scientists are using now to, to develop new production platforms for a whole range of different molecules. So, so we use all of that. And, and out, of, out of then this... Uh, the green side of this slide, plant-based production, and the red slide, side of the slide, bug or microbial-based production, is, is the basis of that title, which I referred to. So I'll focus first on Artemisia annua, this plant that produces artemisinin. It's, this is a plantlet, it's an annual, it grows from seed to seed in one year to about a meter tall. And uh, you can see on the left of this slide now, that on the surface of the leaves, all over the surface of the leaves are these amazing glandular uh, factories that produce artemisinin and the molecule at the bottom. This plant and the molecule was discovered by a woman, Tu Yu a Chinese pharmaceutical chemist during the 1970s. And for that discovery, uh, the plant itself is a Chinese medicinal plant for the discovery. She, she was awarded a Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2015. The first Chinese scientist to, to won, win a Nobel Prize in that category and the first Chinese woman scientist to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, malaria itself is a huge uh, burden on global health and remains so, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And very sadly, you know, the, the majority of deaths occur in children under the age of five, and the statistics are, are quite uh, depressing still. In 2019, there was 409,000 deaths registered by the World Health Organization, uh, as I say, with the greatest burden in sub-Saharan Africa. And sadly, in 2020, those, those figures have gone up, and the, the, the death toll was over 600,000 due, it is thought, to the impact of, of the COVID pandemic as well on, on the ability to get treatments to people. Uh, so we were tasked in, in a way back in 2006 by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to develop the plants for better, more stable production of artemisinin to treat people suffering from malaria. And, uh, and we did that using that scientific strategy, which I just outlined. And, and uh, with that, we were able to make a number of contributions to this whole field uh, uh, and to indeed the supply of artemisinin for people, so, to people suffering from malaria. We developed the first genetic map of Artemisia annua and published that. Uh, we developed new high yielding hybrids of, of the plant. Uh, we developed an effective partnership with a commercial producer of seed so that they could deliver seed to growers at cost price. And, uh, and, and to date, over the last five years, in fact, uh, and, and we know this because we, we, we did the work carefully to, as this went as an impact case study in the recent uh, research excellence framework exercise, uh, our hybrids have been responsible for production of over 62 million anti-malarial treatments for people suffering from malaria. And that's a whole course that will cure people who've got malaria. And we've also got uh, research outputs that support the World Health Organization's claims to use combination therapies, that is artemisinin with other drugs, and that's to prevent the development of resistance in the parasite. So if you have more than one drug treating uh, or attacking the parasite, it delays the, the development of resistance. And this is taken really seriously because artemisinin remains the main drug that's used to treat you if you're suffering from malaria. I want to now move on to the next example, which is opium poppy. This photograph is taken, in fact, of one of our varieties that were developed in York 
and are grown in Tasmania, which is a remote island, as many of you will know, off the south coast of Australia. And that island is responsible for production of about 50% of the world's supply of opiate-based analgesic painkillers for the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, what I want to do now is, is not to bamboozle you with the complexity of this slide, but just to emphasize the number of steps in a biochemical pathway that occurs inside the plant, inside the capsules of an opium poppy, in fact, to produce codeine and morphine, which are at the bottom right-hand side of the slide. And this other compound, noscopine, in the middle bottom of the slide. And uh, as, as, as you heard, noscopine for anti-cough and codeine for, as a painkiller. And, and about 10 years ago, I put this slide up because there was two major gaps in our knowledge uh, to production of morphine and codeine on one hand and noscopine on the other. And, and a lot of our research was focused on filling those two gaps. And the first, the first uh, gap was filled by our discovery of a very unusual gene uh, that's a fusion of two different genes, in fact, that we've worked out more recently, occurred about 20 million years ago. And with that gene fusion, uh, it allowed opium poppy plants to develop this whole pathway to the right of the slide. For, for production of codeine and morphine. And uh, this was a real race along with scientists in the United States and Canada, uh, because they're, they're after these genes, because as I said, they're the tools for synthetic biology to make uh, codeine and morphine in bugs so they could produce essentially by brewing uh, these compounds in, in, uh, in fermenters. And we're still focused on improving the plants because uh, it's still the cheapest way to produce these compounds. Noscopine was another big challenge, and we solved that by discovering a cluster of 10 genes that are responsible for uh, production of noscopine. And with those big discoveries, it then allowed us to develop bespoke varieties of opium poppy that are making specific compounds. And the next few slides, again, I don't want to bamboozle anyone, but I just want to summarize what we've done to then develop these new varieties. So first of all, uh, we, we made another discovery of, uh, of this CODM enzyme and gene, which are responsible for uh, production of, of uh, morphine and oropavin. We discovered that these genes are encoded. Uh, there are three copies of them in the opium poppy genome, and we were able to delete or uh, remove those copies by mutagenesis. And, uh, and that then allowed us to completely remove those morphine and produce a bespoke poppy that makes only not codeine and noscopine. We then built on that and we were able to remove that whole cluster of genes that produces noscopine. And what that meant is that we now have a poppy plant uh, that only produces codeine. So this is one of the commercial varieties that are now grown in Tasmania. We also developed a noscopine-only variety by removing this uh, gene, which we call STORE, which invo is involved in this conversion of S-reticulene to R-reticulene. And when we do that, uh, we basically remove all of the right-hand side of the slide, and we have a poppy that's just making noscopine. So this is really important because it means that when you then grow the plants and harvest them and take them to the factory for, for extraction of the drug, it's a much simpler process if you've just got a, a, if you've just got a harvest that's only making noscopine or one that's only making codeine. And so that's been a real advancement for the whole industry and the supply chain. So, so the, the speed at the, which we did all of that was quite remarkable. So we did all that in about 10 years from, from scratch for both artemisinin and, and, for, and for those compounds from opium poppy. And this is a really nice comment that we got from the head of the opiates division of GlaxoSmithKline Australia. So the reason why we were so successful at doing that was, of course, the team of great people that I have working for me and their commitment to strategic research, but also their commit, commitment to the curiosity of 
how the plant actually does it. And it was those discoveries uh, that always lead to the step change in the technology advance. And, and that's something which we're committed to doing. I don't want to leave the story there. I just want to finish by emphasizing that those two plants, Opium Poppy and Artemisia annua, are amazing at producing th those compounds uh, and, and uh, you know, in, in kilogram amounts in a, in, a, in a field of a hectare. A kilogram of codeine can be produced for about 100 Australian dollars at the farm gate. So that's remarkable. Similar, similar, similar cost for artemisinin production. But, but those plants grow as an agricultural commodity. There's many other plants uh, that produce amazing medicinal compounds that don't grow like that. And, and this on this slide is one of them. This is another class of compounds, diterpenoids, which we're really interested in. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you see this plant, Euphorbia peplis, which, which grows in the wild in the UK. It grows in hedgerows. You see it here growing, in fact, against a, a concrete wall. It's, it's, it's known as, commonly known as milkweed because it produces a milky latex. And uh, so that plant produces a compound called ingodol mebutate, which you see here. Uh, and it's an anti-cancer anti compound, which is used to treat the precancerous skin conditions, which are caused by, by overexposure to the sun. And there's other amazing compounds produced by these medicinal uh, euphorbaceae plants. What we're doing with these, because it's not possible to grow a field of this plant, it's, it's a small weed, is we are lifting those biochemical pathways out of plants and putting them into bugs, such as yeast, and, uh, and, and, and are well on the way to engineering production of some of these other more complex molecules in, in bugs. And so I guess the answer to that question, which the title of, of my talk poses, is that uh, there's a role for both plants and bugs in the future, certainly a role for synthetic biology. And as we get more sophisticated with our synthetic biology, maybe, maybe it will even start to replace opium poppy as a means of production of some of these uh, opiates that we rely on for, for pain relief. And with that, I'll finish and just uh, acknowledge the amazing people that I've had working for me in the CNAP Artemisia Research Project team and our poppy alkaloids team and our medicinal diterpenoids team. And acknowledge the funding from the Garfield Weston Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and from GlaxoSmithKline and Sun Pharmaceuticals, and from UKRI BBSRC, who kickstarted uh, a number of these projects. So thank you.